Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive your word this day. We thank you for revelation. We thank you for truth. We will receive it and walk in it. We praise you for all that you bring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're doing a series of messages exposing false teaching and their effects in the body of Christ. It's very important as we're touching on a lot of subjects and we're talking on controversial subjects. We'll be talking on one today that needs to be addressed so people are not deceived. We see in 2 Peter 2, 1, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. False teachers are here. False prophets are here. Things have been brought forth that are not in line with the Word of God, and everything has to be corrected because the truth must come forth. It's the, the mighty army of the Lord is going to walk in truth in these last days. The remnant is going to be raised up who are going to carry out everything that God says in His Word for us to do. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, deceiving spirits, and doctrines of devils. Those are teaching of devils that are contrary to the word. Anything that's contrary to the word is false. Even if it's a mixture, the devil is a master at mixing a little bit of truth and then bringing in a lie. It's still a doctrine of the devil. Today we're going to address the subject of being saved. Once saved, always saved, or, or is that not so? That is a subject that needs to be addressed as it is quite a controversial subject in the body of Christ. First of all, we know that God is the one who brings forth salvation. And how does he do it? Through Jesus Christ. When a person receives Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, they get born again and they become a son of God, a child of God. John 1.12 As many as received him, receiving Jesus, to them gave you the power, or the right, to become the sons of God. This is the authority or the right to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, we get born again, we become a son of God. We become a child of God. Now, God wants everybody to be saved. One of the teachings out there is that God only predestinates certain ones, which is a lie. He wants everybody to be saved. He is no respecter of persons. Jesus died for all. 1 Timothy 2.4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Every single person is to be saved. It's through Jesus Christ, receiving him where we get born again. That's why Jesus said we must be born again. It is a spiritual birth that occurs from above when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Now, once we are born again and we get a brand new spirit, we're in that stand of being saved and salvation. Does that mean we're in it forever? Well, we need to look at what the scriptures say. First, we need to understand that salvation is not a one-time Thing where we just got saved and then that is it forever. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to un which are, uh, us which are saved, it's the power of God. Now, in order to see what the Word says, we always have to look things up. We look up tense voice and mood of the verbs where, and bring it up in all the cases, but especially in cases where it's really important to understand what's being saved, said and also when there's mistakes. When we look at the scripture, we put the word over perish. These are the ones where they consider it foolish. What is the state of those who have rejected what Jesus has accomplished when he took our sins and bore them away and, and brought forth salvation? They're perishing, present tense, ongoing action. They are in a perishing state, as Young's declares, continuous, repeated. Then it says, unto us which are saved. Well, it sounds like it's already been accomplished, a done deal, past tense, doesn't it? Well, we have to look at this word, saved, and see what it says. It is not a past tense verb. It is a present tense. It means literally 
are being saved. But to unto us which are being saved, Young translates it correctly, those being saved. Well, that makes a big change in understanding about salvation. It's not just a one-time thing. It is an ongoing work and an ongoing action in a person's life. Now, once you're born again, you are saved, and you're, in that, you're still in that state as long as you stay on this road of being saved, which would be walking in line with the Word of God. This is important. We see another place in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. And this again, it says a past tense, but it's not correct in the King James, because it is a present tense again. As Young's brings it out, through which also you are being saved. That's the way you would translate a present tense by which also you are being saved. And then it even adds something important. If, if is a conditional statement. If you keep in memory, it says, now that's not the best translation here. If you retain, would be better for this word, retain that which I have preached or brought forth the good news to you. In fact, when it talks here about this, there's two Greek words here, that, that which, word or speech that I have proclaimed to you. That's why Young's translates it. You are being saved in what words or speech that I proclaimed or preached the good news to you. Showing the fact that you are being saved in the words that are brought forth to you if, if, he goes on and says, if you hold fast, except you did believe in vain. Otherwise, we are to hold fast, we're to retain what he's given to us and to walk in it, act on it, do it, showing that we're following the Lord. So, this is saying that you are being saved if you hold fast to the words that you have heard. Well, that makes quite a statement. We see another place. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. But we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved again. Why they translate it this way is error. It makes you think it's a past tense. It's not. It's again a present tense. Again, Young's brings this out. The reason why I put Young's up here, I think it's the finest translation, even though there are some things that aren't quite right in it. He brings out the tense voice and mood often bringing what's being said. And those being saved. We are unto God a sweet savior of Christ and those are being saved. So showing that this is an ongoing work. We see another scripture, the present tense used often. Acts chapter two, verse 47 where it says, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, it says. Well, that's not a good translation either, because again, it's present tense. What it's saying is, such that are being those being saved. Otherwise, it is begins when you get born again, and now it's an ongoing work as you are taking hold of the word and walking in light with it. Now this is important because you must understand before Jesus comes back and judgment comes to the world, there's gonna be judgment coming to the church first. The church is going to be judged. First Peter chapter four, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. What's the house of God? The church. And if it first, first in time or place, this means, begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And when it speaks here about obeying not the gospel of God, this is present tense. This is talking about someone who is not obeying continually the gospel of God. That also implies 
You're, you just don't get born again and then walk in the ways of sin, the world, the flesh, and do whatever you want. No, you follow the gospel. You've come into covenant relationship with God. You are now to walk according to the word of the covenant that you've come into. Those guys that are obeying not the gospel are in trouble. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? When it says scarcely, it is a word which means with difficulty and not easily, because you will be tempted in every point. The enemy will try to get you off track and not to follow the way of the Lord. Now again, when it says be saved, it sounds like it's a past tense. Well, we look at it again, and we find it is the present tense again in the Greek. If the righteous with difficulty and not easily, are being saved, present tense. Where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Of course, they're done. <laughs> they're finished. You and I must continually walk in line with the Word and walk as one who is following Jesus Christ. That's one who is continually being saved because God is doing this great and mighty work in our life. And if you're going to be able to stand when the judgment comes, it's because you're walking in line with the Word. Revelation 21, verse 24. The nations of them, this is talking about in the end, the nations of them which are saved, again, it brings out the past tense, but it's not a past tense verb. The nations of them which are being saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. This is talking about into the New Jerusalem, showing that there will be nations that are being saved. We want to see this nation be one of the ones that are being saved. But notice, it's showing they're walking the walk of those who are saved. They aren't ones who supposedly signed on the dotted line and then walked on the ways of darkness. No. It is ongoing work. You and I are to walk in line with the Word of God continually. We see over in Romans chapter 1, verse 15. He says, So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome, at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Now when we're talking about believing, that again is present tense. The one who is believing is going to show it forth by his action. If you really believe, you're going to be a doer of the Word of God. You're going to carry out everything that he says for us to do. And that's what he wants to see for, come forth in our life. You be a doer of the Word consistently. It's the Word of the Covenant that you've come into. 1 Corinthians 1.21 But after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And this is again present tense. Those who are believing. Those who are believing, those who are following His Word, those who are putting His Word first place, being a hearer and a doer of it, those are the ones that see the salvation of the Lord. Those are the ones that are following Him. They're in that position of being saved, following the Lord. We see another scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, and that's what he expects for every one of us to come to the place of, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Some people out there teach you that salvation has nothing to do with anything that you do. Well, this destroys that teaching in one verse. It tells you to work out your own salvation, meaning you have a part to play in seeing it come forth. Who's the Savior and who accomplishes it? God does. But how does He do that? When you have a part in playing that by doing what the Word says, working out your own salvation to see Him accomplish it. You can do nothing in your own self. Your works in, your own, in the flesh mean nothing. But doing His Word uh, puts him in operation to accomplish that work in your life. So, when it says work out, let's look at this word. It is an imperative mood. 
It is a command. You and I are commanded to work out. That means it's an order from God. You just can't decide, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. No, you obey and do what he says. Present tense. That means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. You continually be working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You and I are commanded to do that. So that tells you that our salvation is going to be an ongoing process at work in our life as we're working it out by always obeying the Word of God. And then, as you're doing that, what's happening? For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's accomplishing the great work, but it's as you hear and do the Word. He gives you the will through the Word you hear to choose to want to obey it, and he does the work as you are doing it. As you do the Word, he's doing the Word and accomplishing this work. You can do nothing in yourself. It all comes down to you being a hearer and a doer of the Word. We see something else quite significant. Jesus, speaking of him in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Look what it says about Jesus. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect because he overcame and accomplished, you know, overcame every attack came against him, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? Everybody who got born again and signs on the dotted line? No. Unto all them that obey him. Well, does that mean if I obey him once, everything's fine? Present tense. He is the author of eternal salvation to all those obeying continuously him. You look at all these scriptures, it absolutely destroys any teaching that it's a one-time thing. It is an ongoing work, a process of you walking in line with the Word of God. And as we see here, he's the author of eternal salvation for all those obeying him. We see another scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. We've done a teaching recently on importance of doctrine. The doctrine is the teaching of Jesus Christ that now we follow in the New Testament. What does he say? Continue in them. You're to continue in, in the doctrine in all that he tells you to do. This is a command, an imperative mood verb. You and I are commanded to take heed to ourselves and under the doctrine, continue in them, present tense, ongoing action. It's not just I just do whatever I do will work out. No, you're going to do it consistently, consistently doing the word. For in doing this, notice what it says, thou shalt both save thyself. That means you have a part to play in it, don't you? And them that hear thee because you're to be preaching the gospel to others, and if they will take heed to the same thing, they'll see the same result. So in doing the word, it produces the salvation of yourself. So the teaching that says that we have nothing to do with seeing the salvation of the Lord is a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie from the devil, widely taught in the body of Christ, deceiving the multitudes. The effect is people think that it they, they, doesn't matter what they do. It's already a done deal. This is where the once saved, always saved teaching comes. It's a lie from the enemy. That should not make us think that, well, am I going to be saved or not? You should be saved now and always going to be saved. And you know you're always going to be saved because you're following the word. And you're following the Lord. And you're not about to turn away from it in any, at any point in your life. And you have absolute assurance of your salvation. Luke chapter 13, verse 23. Then said one to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Why would they say that? Because all the things they're hearing from what he was teaching, showing them, hey, not everybody's going to be saved. There's only any, now they're saying, are there only going to be a few that are going to be saved? Then he says, strive. And the word strive is this word agonizomai, which means to contend with adversaries. It is the same word translated fight, in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. 
It's talking about you contending with the adversary, fighting, striving against the enemy. So you and I are to strive, contend with the adversary and fight to enter in at the straight gate, which is the narrow gate, because there's only one way. You can only enter in the narrow gate. You can't go in whatever way you want to go. Remember, broad is the way that leads to destruction, as it says in Matthew's account. For many, I say, will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. Oh, they can't get in. Just because they want to get in doesn't mean they're getting in. When it says they're not be able, it's interesting. It's the word isko'o, which means to have mighty force that produces spiritual strength in you. Mighty force. <laughs> isko'o means mighty force, more literally. Otherwise, he's not going to have the mighty force to be able to do it. He won't have it. Future tense, he shall not have it. Why? Because he's not walking in line with the word. He goes on and says, For once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, shut to the door, he begin to stand without and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. He shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Well, these guys are calling him Lord. And he says, I don't know you. Then you shall, shall you begin to say, hey, we've eaten and drunk in your presence and have taught in your street. You've taught in our streets. We heard your word. We are in the very presence of God before. So? Well, that doesn't mean that you're right with God, does it? He shall say, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me. Why does he not know them? Because of what they really are. They're workers of iniquity, which is the word adakia, which really means unrighteousness. They're workers of unrighteousness. What's unrighteousness? Sin, right? Remember what it says? 1 John chapter 5, verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. If they're a worker of righteousness, unrighteousness, that means they're, they're walking in sin. They haven't conquered sin in their life. Those people that are walking in sin continually, instead of overcoming and conquering it and walking in righteousness, they're unrighteous. They're workers of unrighteousness. They're going to hear, I don't know you. Depart from me. They certainly are not going to be saved. It is also important, not only the present tense verbs and the commands that we see, but John chapter 5, verse 34. He says, but I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, here, this is uh, Jesus speaking here, here, that you might be saved. Notice that, that you might be saved. When we look at that particular word, this is a subjunctive mood verb. Now we get moods are important in the Greek. There's five different moods. The mood of reality or fact factual statement is the indicative mood. Otherwise, you'd be making a factual statement that's set. But when you see the subjunctive mood, it is a conditional statement. And the subjunctive mood is a, is a statement that is not a statement of fact. It is conditional upon conditions being met. So he's saying these things I say that you might be saved if you meet the conditions. In other words, there are conditions to a person being saved. Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. Remember the word gets in your heart when you hear it? The devil comes to try to take it out. Lest they, they should believe and be saved, it says. Well, it's not the best way to translate this. Lest they believe, that's okay. But then when it says saved, this is a subjunctive mood verb. In other words, that they, lest they should believe and might be saved, conditional statement. Meaning, if they showed forth that they believe by acting on the word, doing what the word says, carrying it out. Otherwise, just because a person believes doesn't mean they're saved. 
unless they do what the Word says and carry it out and walk in line with the Word of God. We also see this subjunctive mood even brought forth showing the conditions. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God is raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, when he says, if you shall confess, these are all conditional statements, subjunctive mood. And believe in thine heart. Again, we're talking about these statements, conditional, subjunctive mood statements, meaning it's all conditional. That's going to produce the salvation. It's conditional upon us hearing and doing the word of God, and that is so important for us to understand. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, and we're just giving you all these scriptures before we get into the scriptures that really address, that show that once saved, always saved is a, a lie. You can already see it's a lie already by what we brought forth. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. God has not appointed us to wrath. That's right. He doesn't want us to be, get wrath. But to obtain salvation. Otherwise, well, that means something that we're going to get. The obtaining of the obtaining of salvation or the acquiring, as Young's brings it out as another way, or the possessing of salvation. And it's going to be through, because the word by is really dia, meaning through, through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Young's does a good job. But to the acquiring of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that tells us that's an acquiring and obtaining, a possessing of something. Again, showing this is an ongoing work that is all conditional upon you and I meeting all the conditions to see it come to pass. Now, we've already saw the one place where he said, are there few that be saved? We see another place here in Mark chapter 10, verse 26. It says, they were astonished out of measure, saying to themselves, who then can be saved? <laughs> they were blown away. This is where he said it's harder for a, uh, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were all doing pretty well in there. Who then can be saved? Showing the fact that they were really shaken by the things that he was bringing forth. We saw Luke 13, 23, are there few that are being saved? Luke chapter 18, verse 26. They said... They that heard it said, who then can be saved? Again, this is the same thing. Who can be saved? They could hardly believe what he was saying. They were blown away. The reason is because we have all the conditions that must be met. You are saved from the day that you are born again. You are in Jesus Christ. As long as you continue to hear and do the word and walk in his ways, you will stay in that salvation state and you will see the working of salvation be accomplished in your life in all aspects, which is what, he, what God wants. The teaching that says, once saved, always saved, and it doesn't matter what you do after that, is a lie from the devil. It is deceived. The motive is, the effect is, many people who are walking in sin we already saw the ones who are walking in sin. Depart from me, you workers of unrighteousness. People that think that it doesn't matter what I do. They can walk in the ways of the world. They can walk in the flesh. That everything's fine. They're deceived. They've been deceived. Multitudes will be deceived because they have followed lies. Scriptures that clearly show that one saved, always saved is a lie. We're going to look at it at this point. Jude verse, one, verse 5, only one chapter, of course, in Jude, verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. They were saved. They didn't stay saved. They got destroyed because they did not follow the way of the Lord. 
they really didn't believe, because if you believe, you're going to be a doer of the word. This means if you stop believing, you're going to be destroyed. A believer in Christ could stop believing if he doesn't continue in the word of God, or if he would turn away into even some other religion or whatever at all, or just kind of quit following the Lord and just kind of follow his own ways. He's, not, he's going to be destroyed. John chapter 15, verse 2. Every branch in me, let's back up for a moment. I'm the true vine, Jesus is speaking. My father's the husbandman. Every branch, who is the branch in him? You and I are. Every branch in me, that means he's hooked into the vine, so he's born again. That beareth not fruit, he takes them away. They're taken away. Oh, they're not saved anymore. They're not hooked into the vine anymore. They're eliminated. That tells you another thing. If you're not bearing fruit, then you're not going to be saved. How do I bear fruit? From hearing and doing the word. God produces it in our life. If you're following the Lord, it will happen. Fruit is the result of you following the way of the word of God. But if no fruit, yeah, they're going to be removed. There's even a stronger statement in verse 6. If a, ba a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch, he's withered, men gather them, cast them in the fire, and they're burnt. That's not somebody who's saved. They're burnt up. They're eliminated. If you don't abide in him, you must abide in Jesus and follow him all the days of your life. You have absolute confidence. If you're, don't ever think that, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. That's a wrong way of thinking. If you're following the Lord, great, you are. Now, if you're not following the Lord, then you better be thinking that. You're in trouble if you're not putting the Word of God first place and doing what He says. There's another place. Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, it says here, it is impossible. That means it's not going to happen. For those who are once enlightened, meaning they came to the light, so they got light, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, which is mean they were born again, they got the gift of salvation, receiving Jesus, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, which means they received the Holy Spirit. So this is a born-again person who received the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God. Oh, this is someone that was in the word, hearing the word, got revelation of the word, seeing the word working in, and, uh, in their life. And the powers of the world to come, or the age it really means, it's not cosmos, it's aeon. And the powers, as Young's brings it out, of the coming age, more literally, because that's really what this means. Otherwise, he's operating the power of God. He's operating the authority. He's operating doing the mighty works of the Lord by casting out demons, doing mighty works, operating in the power of God. So this is talking about someone who has grown up in the things of God. Remember it said it's impossible. If they shall fall away. Well, that's not the best translation because if you put the cursor over this, it is a participle. And what this means, it's an aorist participle. Now, many of you, you just start coming, think, boy, there's a lot of Greek stuff you keep bringing forth. We have to bring it out. Otherwise, we're never going to know the truth. Aorist is a simple past tense verb. A participle is usually translated having something. That's why Young translates it, having fallen, past tense, away, would be the aorist participle. Actively, voice, means they did it themselves. It wasn't like this, something happened, you know. What, they can't say the devil made me do it kind of thing. No, they did it themselves by not choosing the way of the word. Having fallen away. This is a guy who's already fallen away. Not if they shall fall away. It makes you think, well, I didn't say the guy fell away. It literally says he fell away. Having fallen away, it's impossible, remember, uh, to renew them again unto repentance, 
See, and they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame, having fallen away. These guys haven't fallen away. They're in trouble. This is someone who has deviated from the right path. He's fallen away. He's chosen to move away from the things of God. In fact, in showing what this word means, and bringing up other information that can help you, it's a tremendous program that can do so many things. This is Freiburg's, and he says, literally, fall beside, go aside, go astray, become lost. Figuratively, even the New Testament, of abandoning, abandoning a, formal rela a former relationship, turn away, commit apostasy. That's what it's talking about. He abandoned his relationship. He committed apostasy. He left this relationship. In Launita, same thing to abandon a former relationship. You see over here in the lower right, left corner. Or association, or to disassociate. This guy's, he quit. He fell, he left, left, essentially. So he abandoned the Lord, essentially, is what it's all talking about. Strong says to apostatize. Again, that's what this means. So if the guy has fallen away and apostatized, it is impossible for him to, it says here, to, for him to be renewed under repentance. The reason is you don't grow up in the things of the Lord, get born again, get the Holy Spirit, operate in the Word of God, receive the promises, taste of the good Word of God, operate in the power of God, turn away and throw Jesus out of your life and think that you're going to come back after he's done all this work in you. You're exposing him to public disgrace and ridicule and contempt, essentially, is what this really remains here in the shame. Set forth as a public example, make an example of, expose the public disgrace. You don't do that to the Lord and get away with it. You don't, you don't treat him that way and think that you're going to get anywhere. So this is talking about someone who would come to some level of maturity. And he abandons, he's done. I would say to myself. Or maybe, maybe you would fall, sit in that position. Having come to all the things that God has done in my life and developed, if I ever abandon, I'm done. Of course, I'm never going to do such a thing. But this shows that a guy, once, though once saved, always saved, is a lie. Verse 8. He which beareth thorns and briars. Remember, the guy's supposed to bear fruit or he's taken away. Thorns and briars, that's not good things. He's rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. He's rejected. God is a just God. He wants you to follow, walk in his ways. You can't just do the things that you want to do. Those who are bearing thorns, and again, when we talk about this, this is present tense, ongoing action. It's not like they've had a, a few little falls here and there and some problems. This is their ongoing thorns and briars. That's what their life is producing continually. Obviously, they're not following the Lord. They're rejected. They're nigh unto cursing. Their end will be burned. They are not saved, for sure. We see another place, and this is talking about really at the end of the age, when you understand the ages that are being discussed, but the principles are still the same. Matthew 13, verse 30, verse 40. Here's the parable of the tares. And he talks about the good seed is the son of the good seed of the son of man. The fields, the word, the good seed of the children of the kingdom. Tares are the children of the wicked one. Enemy that sodom's the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, not world, it's aeon. Talking about the end of millennial age. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be in the end of the age. And they will be. They'll be burned up. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and here's why. He shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. This means those that have stumbled and falled. And those who are doing lawlessness. 
The word iniquity is anomia, which means lawlessness. They're law, doing lawlessness. I don't know why they have this unla those doing lawlessness is what it is. And the word do here is a present tense, so this is again talking about someone continually doing lawlessness. They're in trouble. Doing lawlessness is not walking in line with God's New Testament laws. And we have pointed this out before, but we'll point it out again at this point. Well, we'll come back. It goes on before we leave this. What's going to happen to these guys? He's going to cast them into a furnace of fire. They'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> They're finished. Then shall the righteous, those are the ones walking in line with the word, shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now we talk about the lawless, those doing lawlessness. See, this is going to happen in the end. There'll be many who are following lawlessness. That means they're not following the word. Lawlessness is increasing in the world today. If you don't put the Word of God first place in your life and be a consistent hearer and doer of it, you are going to be in trouble for sure. Matthew 24, 12 says, Because lawlessness, anomia, the same word, shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. No, they're in trouble. The many is talking about Christians. How do you know? Because it's the word agape for love. Who has the agape love? Only Christians, not the world. So the love of many, remember the many? The many are not the few. The few are the ones that end up walking the straight, narrow path. The many are the walk the broad way to destruction. Their love waxes cold. Their love for the Lord waxes cold. That's why people that are not hearing and doing the word are in trouble. And they are going to end up being cast into the furnace of fire, as I said, where there's the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. Those who stumble, walking in sin, falling, doing lawlessness, they're all going to be in trouble. In Mark chapter 9, you see, if you really make Jesus Lord of your life and you're walking the ways of the Lord, there's going to be fruit. You're going to be hearing and doing the Word. You're going to be conquering sin. You'll be separate from the world. You will not be walking in the flesh. You will be walking with the fear of God all your days, and you'll be following the way of righteousness. If not, what's wrong with you? There's something wrong. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If the foot offend thee, cut it off. Better for thee to enter hall into life, and having two feet to be cast into hell in the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter in the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Well, what's this all talking about? These are all your members, isn't it? Your hands, your feet, your eyes. You can sin with your eyes, you can sin with your hands, you can sin with your feet, your walk. If you're continually sinning with these ways, you're going to get cast into hell instead of being saved. Now, does he want you to pluck out your eye? No, he wants you to repent and get your sins right. But he says, hey, if that's the only way you can do it, get rid of your eye. It's better at least to not end up in hell. Otherwise, put all the members yielded unto God and don't yield them to sin any longer in your life. We must put the word of God first place. Get away from the things of this world. Turn off the TV with all the garbage out there, unless it's something that's profitable for you, which isn't a whole lot. And stay away from any of the ungodly the movies and all the garbage that's out there. You've got to guard yourself. Matthew chapter 24, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made him ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Oh, this is a servant who's doing the things that God wants him to do. He's going to be blessed. 
Verily I say unto thee, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. That's good news. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and begin, shall begin to smite his fellow servants, eat and drink with the drunken, I mean, he's walking in sin now. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looked not for him, in an hour when he's not aware of, he shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're in trouble. The hypocrites, of course, they end up in hell too. You can't be a hypocrite and be a Christian. You gotta be the real deal. There's gonna be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These guys are gonna be sent. They're gonna be in trouble. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 26, he says, his Lord said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put the money in the exchanges, then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. He said, Take the talent from him, and give it to him that has ten talents. Every one that ha him that hath shall be given, he shall have abundance. From him that hath not shall be taken away that which he even hath. And what happens to the unprofitable servant? You cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. That means you need to be doing what God wants you to do. If you're an unprofitable servant, you're not going to be saved. Unprofitable servant is one who's useless, good for nothing. He's not walking in line with the Word of God. He's going to be in trouble. Revelation chapter 3. The once saved, always saved teaching is is a lie and is deceiving multitudes and they're going to end up in hell instead of being saved because they've listened to the lie. Revelation 3.15 This is the church at Laodicea. He says, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. If you're hot, you're doing the right thing. If you're cold, you're nowhere, but at least God can try to get you and get you up to get you to come to repentance and get hot, get right. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, that means he's got a combination of both. Well, that's the guy who's got some good things, but he's got a lot of bad things too, making him lukewarm. Oh, that's the hypocrite, that's the compromiser, that's the guy that's, you know, got sin in the camp. A little leavens, leavens the whole lump. And the whole thing is contaminated. But because you're lukewarm and cold, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's not somebody who's saved. Somebody gets spewed out of his mouth is not someone who is going to be with the Lord. He's in trouble. Why is he in this state? Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. I don't need anything. What's he looking at? He's looking at his goods. He's looking at his money. He's looking at all the things that he's been able to accomplish, and he doesn't think he needs anything. He doesn't need the Lord. This is a person who's all relying on self. Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, what does this mean when he's saying these things to him? When he says wretched, this particular word is used two times, shows the usage of it, in the Greek. This other use shows you, gets a revelation of what it means to be wretched. It's in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, same word, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So, a wretched person is someone living according to the body of death. And the guy, and he says, you are wretched. So what was the revelation? He's living according to the body of death in the flesh, in sin. He's walking in the flesh. Somebody who's walking in the flesh is wretched. What's the next one? He said the guy in Revelation 3, here, verse 17, he was miserable. Well, what is it? Why, why was it? What was this miserable? And from God's standpoint, he's spiritually miserable. Again, this one also is used two times, as you see, 
And in the other use, you can get the revelation of what it means for him to be spiritually miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If in this life only, talking about the physical, natural life only, we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Otherwise, if it's only in this life we have hope of Christ, we're, we're most miserable. And that's where he uses this. Otherwise, if our hope is in the natural, physical life only, if there isn't some life to come, we're miserable. So what is this point? That shows that this guy was miserable because where was his real hope? His whole hope was in his natural, physical life. He did, wasn't considering the things of, that would affect him in the life to come. He was basically living for the now. You don't live for the here and the now. If you're living for the here and the now, you are miserable in the sight of God. You are to be living knowing that everything you're doing is going to affect you in the life to come in eternity. It all has spiritual implications for us. So he's just living in the, for, uh, you know, whatever his own needs being met and things he wants to do today. The next guy, he's poor. Someone's poor is lacking. He's lacking spiritual things. The guy who's blind, he cannot see spiritually. He's blind spiritually. And he's naked. Naked is someone who's not spiritually clothed. We're to be spiritually clothed with what? Righteous garments. We have to put on the garments of God. So, what's going to be the answer for this? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. you got to buy the gold, which is the word, is the word is what's gold, precious like gold, tried in the fire. You've got to get the word. And it costs you something. You've got to spend some time. The Bible talks about, in Proverbs, about buying the truth because it costs you. You have to spend effort and time to get in the Word of God, your whole effort to get find it. If you're not in the Word, studying the Word, and learning the Word on an ongoing basis, what are you doing with your life? You're wasting it. Counsel me, gold, buy in the fire, gold, gold the Word, cried in the fire, that you might be rich. We want the riches of Christ, the things of God. And white raiment, white clothing. Oh, that's the garments of God. But thou mayest be clothed. Otherwise, you're not clothed. You're spiritually naked before him. The shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And thine eyes, with, anoint thine eyes with eyes salve that you might see. Their eyes, see, they were blind spiritually. They couldn't see. Their eyes weren't being opened because they were not getting revelation knowledge. This is the definition of someone who's lukewarm. They don't get revelation knowledge. They can't see. They don't have spiritual clothes on. They don't have the word. They don't have the riches of Christ. They're just wholly consumed with themselves and what they want and the things that are going on in this natural world. From God's standpoint, they're wretched, they're miserable, they're blind, they're naked, they're poor spiritually. This is someone who's basically just living in the flesh. Someone who's living in the flesh is going to hear they're being spewed out. Well, they might be born. Remember, these guys were born again. So what? They weren't walking the walk. They weren't following the Lord. Revelation 3, verse 1. Under the church, angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and that thou hast a name, that thou livest and are dead. Remember to every one of the uh, churches, he always starts out saying, I know thy works because your works show forth your faith, your fruit, your walk, what you've been doing. And notice, this is a guy who, oh, he's a Christian in name only. He has a name that he lives, but he's dead. You can't even tell he's a Christian when you look at the, all the fruit and everything in his life. He's just, he's just, he's got, he's the guy that's got the talk, but not the walk. A Christian in name only. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. A whole lot's died out and about everything else is ready to die out. This guy's going down, 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 down. For I have not found thy works perfect. The word perfect means 
filled up or fulfilled, not perfect. It's a mistake in the translation. Here it is, full or filled up, you see below. Fulfilled. What does that imply? Your works are to be fulfilled. What works? Working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Accomplishing all the things that God wants so God can accomplish his great work in you. If you don't do the works, what have you been doing with your life? <laughs> We're in trouble. We need to be doing the things that God says. I've not found your works fulfilled before God, he says. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. So this guy was born again. He had received. He had heard the word. Now you're supposed to hold fast, get, get this word back in you. Hold fast and repent. If there, therefore thou shalt not watch, I'll come on thee as a thief, and you shall not, thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. So what was the answer for these guys? Or the problem with these guys? They'd all defiled their garments, walking in sin. They weren't walking in the way of righteousness. Their works were no good. But there were a few that didn't. They didn't defile their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. We did a message on those who walk worthy before the Lord not too long ago. Another, all these messages are extremely important. You have to walk worthy of the Lord if you're going to be found worthy. He's walk worthy with, in white. Walk before me in white, in righteousness, holiness, for they're worthy. He that conquers and carries off the victory, which is what this word means, nakao, to conquer or carry, and carry off the victory. And this isn't because I just did it once. This is because I'm doing it and continually doing it. It is a present tense, ongoing, continuous work that's being accomplished in my life. If you've turned away from conquering and overcoming and stuff, and you've turned back to the world or flesh or something, you're in trouble. He who is conquering and overcoming continually and carrying off the victory, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Otherwise, the only way you get the garments of God on, the white raiment is by conquering and overcoming all the enemies in your life and walking in line with the word of God. You gotta overcome the flesh, you gotta overcome the devil, you gotta overcome the world, all these things. And notice what he says, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. What does that imply? His name could be blotted out of the book of life. But he's been saying, hey, if you meet the conditions, I won't blot your name out of the book of life, essentially. If you are overcoming and conquering and you are clothed in white raiment, I'm not going to blot your name out. Because you're right. You're walking right. And I've been able to do the work in you. But I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. That means if all the guys out there that are living in name but are dead, Christian in name only, they're done if they don't repent and get right. All those ones whose works are not fulfilled before God, that are defiling themselves, they're going to get their name blotted out. The ones who are hearing and doing the word and conquering and overcoming, being clothed with white raiment, they're going to be confessed before the Father and before the angels, and they are going to be ones that are going to be saved. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Remember, the guy didn't have fruit, he gets taken away. So how do we know people? By their fruits, and how does God know us? By our fruits. Our fruits are very important. Fruit's going to be the result of the word in your life. It produces the fruit. As you hear and do the word, God produces the fruit. Look at the changes that have occurred in your life already. Look at the things that God has eliminated and what things he's brought in your life, the good fruit from the word of God. That's God working, evident that you have fruit in your life. That's how you know him. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. That means they just got done saying, we know them by their fruits, so the fruits must be important. But anybody who just says such and such, that's not going to get at men. But he that doeth, poieo, present tense, ongoing action, 
continually doing, is doing, this is why I like Young so much, he brings out what the verb tense is, is doing continually the will of my Father which is in heaven. What's that implying? The guy who's doing the will of the Father in heaven, he's the one that's got the fruits. The one who's not doing the will of the Father in heaven, he doesn't have the fruits. He calls him Lord, but he's not going to enter in. He's going to be shut out because he's not, he's not the tr walking in line with the word. Then he says, many, and this is not a few, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, they're calling him Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? How can you prophesy? You've got to be born again. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. You have to have the gift of prophecy and be yielded in function to it. This is someone who's born again. In thy name have cast out devils. Who can cast out demons? Not an unbeliever. Remember the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast them out by calling on the name that Paul preaches? They got blasted by the devil. Their clothes were torn off, fled out of the place naked and wounded. They got nowhere. Only those people who are born again have authority, understand their authority, and use their authority in operating in casting out the demons. That's a Christian, right? And thy name done many wonderful works, not a few. We're talking about Christians here. No question about it. Yet most all the pastors and all the teachers out there say, this is not talking about Christians. It sure is. It's clear as a bell. Then will I profess unto them, the many, all that said all these things. Remember, this is all past tense. Prophesied, past tense. Cast out, have cast out, it's past tense. Have done, done many wonderful works, all past tense. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. See, they reason it in their minds. Well, if he never knew them, of course he knew those people because he knows, he remembers things. So they're reasoning in their mind that that, in their mind thinking that, well, they must not have been Christians then. No, they don't understand what it means when he says, I never knew you. You can't reason things in your mind. You've got to get revelation from the word. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now remember the other one was says, depart from me, you who are workers of unrighteousness. And what about this guy? The word work is present tense. So this means this person is continually working something. In the past, they apparently were right with the Lord, born again, prophesying, casting out demons, wonderful works, walking with him, but not anymore. Now they're continually working what? Anomia, which again the word lawlessness. And we talked about the lawlessness, causes the many to love love of the Lord to wax cold. These guys are working lawlessness. So what is it that causes them to hear this, that depart from me, you are working lawlessness, and that he says, I never knew you. How did, it get to, how did they get to the place of being one minute they were born again and right with the Lord, which they were, in verse 22, and the next minute he doesn't even know them anymore because they had turned from the Lord and they were now working lawlessness. What does it mean when he says, I never knew you? We have to go and understand about righteousness. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21. If the wicked, it's a sinning person walking in sin, will turn from all his sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That's a guy who, he's now walking in righteousness. All his transgressions that he has committed, it's all the sins, all the things that were contrary to the word that he's committed, they shall not be mentioned. The word mentioned means remembered, recalled, or called to mind. They won't be remembered unto him. What happens when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and we start following the Lord, we've confessed our sins, we've turned away from him, and we're following the Lord and walking in his ways? All of our sins are washed away and he does not remember them anymore. They're gone. It's as if they never were. Oh, that's good news. That's for all of us. If we're walking right. In his righteousness that he had done, he shall live. 
Verse 24, when the righteous turns away from his righteousness, well, that's a guy who was walking right, but he's not walking right anymore. Like those guys that were, must have been walking with right, prophesying, casting out demons, doing many new works, and now they weren't walking right anymore. Now they're working lawlessness. And commits iniquity and does it, doeth according to all the abominations the wicked man doeth, shall he live? The answer is no. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be remembered or called to mind. Righteous things? What righteous things? They're gone. Why? Because they quit walking in the way of righteousness. Now they're walking in the way of lawlessness. That's why he says, I don't know you, because what they turn from. He knows you at what you are at a point in time. You continue to follow the way of the Lord. He knows you are following the Lord. You throw him out of your life and you turn away and you start walking in lawlessness. He doesn't know you. All your righteousness is gone, as if it never was. That's why it says what it says. He, those guys, of course, are not going to be saved. God wants us to understand the teaching, one saved, always saved, as we've seen from all these scriptures, is all a big lie from the devil. The devil has deceived people. Matthew chapter 8, we'll look at one more this morning. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. Well, we'll back up for a moment. Here's a centurion. He's a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go and he goeth, to another come and he cometh, to my servant do this and doeth it. Otherwise, what was the mark about this guy? He understood that Jesus could speak words in authority and the demons and the sickness and disease would obey. He was a man under authority that followed what he was told to do. He was in authority and he, tell, he, tell, he used the, that authority to speak to the, to the soldiers under him and they'd obey. He operated according to authority. Jesus said, I've not found so great faith, no, not in Israel, when he heard it. And he says, many shall come into the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, oh, those are people that were in the kingdom, shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, why would that be? Because they are not submitted unto God and under his authority and obeying him and following what he says to do. They're just walking their own ways. <laughs> the children of the kingdom, shall be cast out into outer darkness, really in sons of the kingdom. So they were born again, but they get thrown out. Why? Because this guy was submitted, and these other ones are not submitted to God, and they will not be saved. God wants us to make sure we are following the Lord and following him all the days of our life. Well, we've begun this. We've got a lot more to talk about. we got about halfway through this. And we have many scriptures that we're going to bring forth tonight on this subject of showing that once saved, always saved is a lie. And when you get done hearing not only what this morning and tonight's, you should be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that once saved, always saved is a lying doctrine of the devil. And what is the effect? It is deceived the multitudes of Christians, most everybody teaches this, thinking that it doesn't matter what kind of a walk I have in my life, it's not going to matter. And they're going to be, look what we saw in Matthew 24, 12. That because the love of many shall wax cold, because of the abounding of lawlessness, they're going to wax cold, they're going to be in trouble. If the lukewarmer cast out, you know that the cold are finished. They're not going to be saved. You and I must walk the walk and follow the Lord. Now, this should put the fear of God in you. It should not make you think, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Unless you're not committed to following the Lord, then it will do that. If you're born again, 
and you're following the Lord and He's first place in your life and you're a hearer and a doer of the Word and you're conquering sin and you are serious in your walk with the Lord, you are saved, you stay that way, you will stay saved, you should have absolute confidence you're saved and that's the way it's going to be and you have absolute peace. You don't have any wondering if I'm saved or not. You know it. I know I'm saved. I know it. You should know you're saved. But if you're not committed, and if you're not putting the Word of God first place, and you're not going to follow Him, you're in trouble. You must get yourself right. Do not believe this line teaching. All these scriptures clearly show it already. And the ones you see tonight... <laughs> are also extremely powerful. They're going to show the same thing as we go through the rest of them tonight. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for revelation of the truth regarding salvation. I thank you that I am born again. I am saved. I understand that salvation is an ongoing process, an ongoing work, an ongoing walk. I see the present tense verbs, the conditional statements, and the subjunctive moods. I see the conditions that must be met. And that I, walking with the Lord, continually am saved, am being saved, and will stay saved all the days of my life. If I do not follow the way of the Lord and I obey, do anything in any of these scriptures showing forth that I'm not saved, I will not be saved. I thank you. I make Jesus Christ truly Lord of my life. I put the Word of God first place. I am a hearer and a doer of the word. I will not walk in sin or the ways of the world or the ways of the flesh. I will follow the Lord. I will always be hot. I will never be lukewarm. My eyes are on the Lord. I will be a hearer and a doer of the word of God and never turn away from following the Lord all the days of my life. I am saved. I will stay saved. Thank you for salvation and eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. So you should never doubt it. Just make sure you're on, always on track, following after him. Praise God. I trust this has helped you. And if you had any question about this subject when you came here today, you shouldn't have any question now beyond a shadow of a doubt after looking at all these scriptures and then the ones that we'll be bringing forth tonight. I hope you can come. If not, get the message and hear it because it'll be a very important message, scriptures as well to show forth the truth on this subject. Father, thank you for much fruit. As we understand the truth, we will walk in line with the word and we will share the truth with others so they're not deceived. Father, we will not ever let ourselves be Christians in name only or walking and defiling ourselves or any of these evil things or allowing lawlessness that's coming on the whole world to get a hold of us. We will walk according to your ways and follow you all the days of our life. Father, I thank you. There'll be much fruit. And I thank you for all that you're accomplishing in each one of our lives as we are saved and will stay saved as we follow you all the days of our life. Thank you for much fruit from this message we hear and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.